Welcome, everyone. My name is Cal McDonald, and I am the Sustainability Specialist with MCIC, and I'll be your host for this evening. So our speaker today, David A. Robertson, is a graphic novelist, podcast host, public speaker, and an acclaimed author of numerous award-winning books for young readers. He's published over 25 books, including 2016's When We Were Alone and 2020's On the Trap Line. Uh, both of which won Governor General's Literary Awards. Uh, his writings about Indigenous peoples in Canada have educated and entertained many readers, while also illuminating contemporary issues many Indigenous people face today. He's the host of the CBC podcast, Kiweo, which takes listeners on a journey of David uncovering family history and connecting with his Cree identity. Uh, David is also a member of the Norway House Cree Nation that currently resides in Winnipeg. In 2020, David released the memoir, Black Water, Family, Legacy, and Blood Memory. In this memoir, David reflects on his upbringing in Manitoba, where he was largely unaware of his Indigenous roots. His complex relationship with his father is explored under the backdrop of a trip they take together up to northern Manitoba. This trip is to a trap line where David's father spent his childhood. Uh, the memoir has received numerous awards, including being named one of Globe and Mail's top 100 books of the year in 2020. Uh, we feel very lucky and privileged that David is here to uh, tell some of his story. Uh, so with that, I will pass it over to David. And thank you so much for being with us today. Hi, everybody. It's uh, really nice to be here. Nice to be, uh, to visit, to be visiting with you tonight. Um, Thanks for asking me to be here to MCIC and and um, I'm looking forward to the hour. I thought what I would do is um, just talk to you a little bit about myself and um, some some of the inspirations for the book and do a couple of readings from it and uh, and then take questions, which is really it's always my favorite part is taking questions. My problem is is that I ramble, so I'm going to try and keep my eyes on the clock to uh, make sure I wrap up my part at 7.45 to leave time for you to ask me stuff. Um, and, you know, I think that that's a, one of my favorite parts because I like to talk to people, but also because if we're really going to talk about reconciliation, it's not a one-way street. We, um, you know, we have to talk to each other and listen to each other. So, um, so well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that part. Um, so what I thought I would do is just kind of go over, yeah, what, where Blackwater came from and, um, and some of the other projects that I look at as almost sister projects to Blackwater. Uh, you know, there's, there's a series of stories that I call like my, my, my dad trilogy. I was calling it that before my dad passed away. Um, there's obviously the Blackwater, which is my memoir. Um, there is my a uh, picture book on the trap line, uh, which um, I just mentioned uh, one of the governor generals last year. And then there's a, there's a podcast, Kiweo, all about my dad. Um, and it was kind of around this time where dad was getting a little, little older and, um, and you kind of, there's a, there's a moment in your life where you are aware of your parents' mortality. And I just felt like I needed to document as much as I could about him and our relationship. Um, because I just, there's a feeling, I just had a feeling that, you know, that there would come a time soon where I wouldn't be able to do it. And so I just started working on these projects. And originally I was working on them with him. Um, and so he was there during the development of a lot of it. It was actually like, you know, you talk about uh, research for all these, it was a lot of research for books like this. A lot of my research was, was my dad. So, um, and I'm really grateful for that time because we spent um, over a week in 2019 um, in, just interviewing each other. And I was able to record a lot of it. Um, and that's where the podcast came from. Um, but I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. But I was recording all of our interviews, mostly me interviewing him. And, um, and then, you know, when he passed away later that year, it's not only that I had all this, you know, research material that I got from him, learned more about his life than I'd ever had before. But now I have, you know, his voice, 
um, you know, with me all the time. So, and the great thing about that is, is, is uh, you know, of course, I'd prefer that he was here, but um, I, he can still teach me things, which I, I think that's a, a, a real gift um, to, to, to have him with me. And it's why, you know, we, I did another episode of QAO. It was supposed to be five episodes. We did a sixth episode because I was listening to his recordings and I was realizing that he was still teaching me things. And it felt, made me feel like, you know, he's, he's gone, but um, there are ways in which you can keep people around you. And I think that is, um, is a really important thing to, to have, uh, even though it's tough to reconcile, you know, the reality of the gravity of the loss. Um, but even keep keeping like little relics around like this, I, I, I'm holding, I always hold this, this stick when I'm talking about my dad and it's um, the, the walking stick I got my dad when I was on, on the, on the trap line with him. Um, I got him this little piece of driftwood to use as a cane on the land. And then when he passed away, I was able to, um, he kept it. So I was able to get this cane from him. So just stuff like that. Anyway, rambling already. So um, I thought I would just kind of, start off with a little reading from Blackwater. And why I wanted to start off with this little reading, it's just the prologue, is because that's where it all starts. You know, um, I wasn't really thinking too much about doing any of this until I went to the land with my dad. Um, and you talk about sustainability and, and things like that. Um, when, when, we, when we went onto the land together, it was the first time I'd really been on a trap line or, or out, you know, deep in the middle of nowhere. Um, in the middle of everywhere really um and so I, I and i learned so much that day with my dad like he we spent the day and he just taught me um that day and what what i really came to appreciate more than anything was how much um how much the the the, the land and the waters give us you know how how much life it gives us um there's a moment when i went onto the onto the water with my dad on the way to the trap line my dad at that time, you know, was getting frail and was unsteady and losing his balance a lot. And um, he looked he looked his age for the first time, really. You know, when he was about 60, 70 years old, people never believed he was 60 or 70 years old. They always uh, thought he was like 40 or 50. Um, so he always looked so young and um, he was beginning to look his age. So we went out onto the water and. Um, we were on the boat together and he was looking out, you know, uh, over, uh, over the land and the waters, the water was his favorite thing in the world. Um, besides probably his wife and my, and my brothers and I, uh, and he just looks, he looks so much younger. It was just this incredible thing where all of a sudden he, he looked like he just like had 10 years given to him. Um, it was, I could not, could not even explain how that happened, except for the fact that it was the waters in the land. It was kind of. Bring, bring, giving life to him. Um, so we spent the day out there together. And, and so what, what I came to understand was that we need to respect the land better for what it gives us, you know, because I, I really um, learned more than anything out there that this is not a codependent relationship that we have, us and the land, right? Like it's, um, the land gives us everything. The land uh, gives us resources to live. The waters give us life, um, and without them, we would be in big trouble. Um, and you know, as humans, as a, as a, as a spe as a race, as a species, um, we are pretty greedy. Um, generally, not it's not saying you are, but you know, in generally, as, as human beings, we're pretty greedy. We take too many things. We take too much. We want more. We always want more. We want things more. We want things quicker. Um, and there is something to be said about slowing down and just take what you need you know and that's it's a, it's a big difference um my dad used to have this saying uh, that he told me about living on the land and it was you know if you were hungry you went out and you caught something you didn't have a stockpile of food in the fridge um it was just you know you needed it you went out and got it um and i think that's a really kind of beautiful way to live and, um, and, you know, speaking of like this codependent relationship, which is not, um, you know, the land would be better off without us, without people. And I really came to understand that. Um, and so we, that there's humil humility that we need to have as people. I don't want to lecture you, but, um, but we completely rely on the land. So, you know, um, 
because we have nothing to give the land that it needs, we need to honor and respect it. You know, whether we catch an animal, whether we drink water from the from a lake, whether whatever it might be, um, and we need to respect it for that. And you know, as Indigenous people, sometimes we would play tobacco for those kind of sacrifices, those gifts. But um, there's we can do that in our own ways. Anyway, that's just that's just a quick little preamble. Um, but we went out to the lab with my dad, and before that, though, it was the year before that where this all really started. And it was a coffee date I went with my on, with my dad, and we went on, went on a lot of coffee dates together. And he sat me down uh, in this cafe by my work called Stella's here in Winnipeg. If Winnipegers here will know Stella's, but um, and he just asked me if I would take him to his trap line, and i have been waiting for it. I didn't want to ask him if I could go. I wanted to, I wanted him to ask me. And, uh, and he asked me to go and, you know, he hadn't been for seven decades, uh, a lifetime, and I had never been before. And so I, what, what, what came over me then and what I realized when I went out onto the land was that, you know, the journey that we were on together, and I, I do think my dad and I were on a journey, um, that was our destination. That was the years that we put in, the work that we put in to, you know, to um, strengthen our relationship, to, for us to become best friends. Um, you know, that was where we were headed all that time. And I really realized that. And so I wanted to, then that's when I thought, I want to write about that. <laughs> you know, as a writer, you kind of like, that's your knee jerk is like, I want to write about that. So I, I, I wanted to write about it. So I, and that eventually became Blackwater. Anyway, so I thought I would, what I would do is I read to you um, the prologue and, uh, and then I'll kind of go from there. I'll show you some videos, some pictures of where the trap line is and stuff like that too. Maybe that will be interesting, interesting to you, but. Um, so this is just the, the prologue of where this all started. And I would say it started, this is where the, the picture book started. This is where the uh, podcast started. This is where the, the memoir started. It was this, this, this moment right here. So this is the prologue. I might skip, I might skip over a couple of things just as I, as I read through, but. Dad and I are sitting at a cafe by my work. He's ordered an Earl Grey tea with some sweetener. I have a decaf coffee splashed with almond milk. I'm facing dad in a mirror and I trade glances between him and my reflection, wondering where the years have gone. I'm growing my hair out and all I can see are the gray strands. I tease my wife, Jill, who's Métis, that I'm aimless, aiming for a man bun. <laughs> but it really bugs her, by the way. But I really think I'm trying to connect with something that I've been working hard to understand since I was in my late teens. And that is what it means to be Cree. I guess I feel as if long hair would make me more indigenous. Growing up, I had this vision of what an Indian is and like it or not, that vision, despite all the work I've done has stayed with me. In reality, a lot of my indigenous friends have braided hair and a lot of them have short hair. It's a good thing my hair grows so slow. I've got time to figure out if I'm bugging Jill or trying to be cultural. That's the thing about journeys. They're never really over. I'll probably be doing this when, when I'm dad's age. Maybe I won't be deconstructing the reasons why I'm growing out my hair, but it'll have something to do with identity. It'll have something to do with what it means to be Cree. My dad is Donald Alexander Robertson, duelist to those in our home community, Norway House, Cree Nation. He's got an easy way about him. Always has, but it's nothing to do with his 82 years. Everything he does is purposeful and measured. For a middle-aged guy living with anxiety, I find comfort in the way he exudes calmness. It's in the way he walks. It's in the way he talks. Dad says something only when he believes he has something important to say. He's thoughtful and deliberate. I've learned to be patient in speaking with him, to watch his eyes, which are smaller than they appear behind prescription lenses, while he search for the right words, and then to listen carefully because he won't repeat himself. I've learned through practice because, dad's, because conversations with dad aren't new. We've been at it for a while and often have sprawling discussions that somehow lead us into a better recognition of ourselves. The cafe is a frequent setting for our talks, but they don't exclusive, exclusively occur here. There's always the golf course or mom and dad's house or the car or restaurant both of us can eat at or before the lights dim in the movie theater. At the cafe, dad gives me most of his attention, except when a friend walks by, which isn't uncommon. He used to run the place I work at now in the early 2000s and still knows people there. He likes to have coffee with me and then see his pals. 
He roams the hallways with his easy stride and seeks people out. He's got a laugh that echoes through the building. You know when he's around and it's infectious. People say that dad and I have the same laugh. People say that dad and I have the same walk. If you look quickly at a picture of dad's basketball team at Cook Christian Training School in the mid-1950s, you'd think that I'd pulled a Marty McFly and was standing there in his place. I like that we have these similarities. We've been having these conversations for almost 30 years. I'll ask dad a question about his life, referencing any period between 1935 and now. He'll think about it over a sip of Earl Grey tea, then respond. It'll be either the most thoughtful answer you can imagine, one that feels as though he's prepared for it, and he probably has, or utterly dismissive, disappointing, because I want to know more, because I expect more, or at least something different. You know, he said to me recently, you can't tell my story from my perspective. This is your story, even if it's about me. It has to be that way. His story, my story, I'm not sure it's that simple. It's our story. And whether it's about a time in his life or a time in mine, what I want is to figure out how his life and my life and our relationship have shaped who I am. Time has moved quickly for me as well as for dad. I notice this when we talk. Sometimes it feels like looking at him as another sort of mirror altogether. Not just because we walk the same or laugh the same. I see in him things I want to be at the age of 82 and things I do not want to be because of the choices I think he made and how they affected me, even though I can't and wouldn't change what has happened. That's confusing for me, but it's a reality I've come to accept. I, uh, from what I understand, dad, a broad-shouldered, tall Cree, and mom, English, Irish, Scottish, with a beautiful smile and flowing brown hair, chose not to raise me and my brothers as Cree to keep us from the difficulties they thought we might face growing up in Winnipeg as First Nations kids. I don't think Cam and Mike even knew they were Indigenous, and I certainly didn't. We never talked about it. What do you regret most, I once asked Dad in the car on the way home from an afternoon at our local golf course. That I didn't, that I didn't teach you the language, he responded, which I took to mean I didn't teach you about who you are. There are times when I catch myself staring at him and comparing the dad I have in my life now with the other versions I knew growing up, if I knew him at all. His job is always a mystery. I never asked about it. So too was his home community, Norway House. I didn't hear about it till I was a teenager. When I spent time with him, I was just happy to see him. We didn't have the kind of talks that we do now. We used to golf on the weekends. We used to go to the movies, but I never thought he'd be the best man at my wedding. I never thought he'd sit with me over coffee and answer all the dizzying questions I throw his way. I watched his veins shift with each movement of his hand the protruding tendons dance under his weathered brown skin. I watch his hand and think about his life and the lives of those who came before him, about my paternal grandmother, Sarah Robertson, who I called Nana. That's one of the only things I can remember about my grandmother, what I called her. The rest of my memories are of, of her are just images. She's sitting in the kitchen in her house somewhere off Osborne Street wearing a flowered dress, her arms outstretched and ready to receive me, ready for me to run across the room and collide with her. It's like she has a dream. I, it's like she's a dream I had once. Dad and I haven't yet started our dance of questions and answers today. Since he knocked on my office window and we ambled over to the cafe, we've talked about the weather, how mom's doing, how my kids are doing, how he's doing, how I'm doing. He's wearing navy blue slacks that work hard to hide the boniness of his legs but fail. Hush puppies on his feet, a white t-shirt underneath a black v-neck sweater a fall jacket, even though it's late summer. He gets cold easily. He looks contemplative, his eyes are narrowed, eyebrows collapsed, sending wrinkles across his forehead. When his eyebrows are relaxed, the lines remain. I have those too, like him. What are you thinking? I take a sip of coffee, then place it back onto the table. We meet eyes. There's four feet of air between us. We're in the least intimate setting, but I've never felt closer to him. He's absently playing with the lid of his tea, then leans forward the smallest distance. I want to go to my trap line one last time, he says. I know he hasn't been to his trap line for almost seven decades. We've been on a journey as father and son for 30 years, and for the first time, it feels like we found our destination. And I think maybe we've been headed there all this time. Whatever truth exists between us, the end of our journey is in front of us. My dad is in his early 80s, and despite my best efforts to will his immortality, He's not getting any younger. 
he will not be a boy again. He will not be the father I used to know, the father I was unfamiliar with again. Years from now, he will not be this father either. Years from now, he will exist in memories, and I will be left to collide with the open arms of those moments. Okay, I say, let's go. After all this time, I think we're ready. So that was just the prologue. And um, this is the, I don't know if I showed you the cover. I don't know if you read it or not, but this is the cover of Blackwater right there. So that was the prologue. And that moment, I still, you know, as you get older, you kind of forget everything. But that, that moment is, is uh, very clear to me. Um, Dad asking me to, to go um, take him to, the, to his trap line called Blackwater. Um, and so the, so that was in 2018. And in uh, 2019, we went to his trap line together. Um, no, two, that, sorry, that was 2000, 2017. 2018, we went to the trap line together um, and spent the day out there. And that was in the summer 2018. Um, and that was the moment where, you know, when we got to the trap line, and I stepped out on, on, uh, from the boat onto the land, and someone had asked this in the, in the chat, I think, about blood memory. Um, but, like, that's what it was. And it was this really interesting feeling of um, belonging. Um, and I think we all kind of have that. You know, it's not like, it, it's not like a, a, a strictly Indigenous thing, right? I mean, it's this feeling of belonging in the place where our ancestors used to live, right? So... Um, it's, it comes from these like passed down experiences, um, this kind of sense of place, of family, of community, and, um, and we remember it, you know, uh, it's woven into who we are. Um, we're kind of, it's hardwired into us. I believe that, you know, it, when I first went to Norway house with my dad in 2001, I believe around there, um, I remember stepping off the, the van onto the, the land, uh, Norway House, on Treaty Land, Treaty 5 territory in Norway House. And I just felt like, oh, I've come home. Like, I just felt this feeling of home. And, um, and the chief kind of gave me his jacket right off his back and welcomed me there. And I just felt like, this is, I belong here, you know. And, and um, so I'm very proud to be a, a Norway House Cree Nation band member. Um, and I felt that even more when I when I stepped out onto the land with black on, onto the land with my dad on Blackwater. I felt like, you know, my feet belong here. You know, it was almost like my family was was welcoming me, welcoming me there. Um, and it was really this tangible feeling. Um, and so when when we after we spent the day there. And my dad and I and by the way, my dad, you know, at that time he was really tired all the time. He wasn't like he's always been like this really, um, really happy. I don't know if anybody know Don Robertson, but like he was always just like, I mean, his laugh was like so loud and so lovely. And he was always like so um, positive. And, and then the last year, he just was kind of losing that a little bit. Um, and, and then when we, when we left the land, we were waiting for the airport, uh, the, the plane in the airport to go back home. And we had just left the trap line and I took a selfie with him and he just looked like so happy. And I have a picture of it. I'm going to show you um, that picture. And he looks like, he looks like a little kid, you know, um, just, just smiling uh, and just so happy that we had gone together. And, um, and I was just like, you know, that was like the best day of my life. So it was amazing. Like you look at his face and I think you just see how much it means to him to go there. And to go there with me, it was really, you know, really a, a special day for us. Um, and you didn't see that kind of energy from him before uh, for, uh, for a little while. And, and certainly after that, he kind of, he, well, he died, you know, in the next year. Or so, um, but th that day was, you know, the best. Um, and so we, we left the, the, the land and we flew back home. And, um, and it's kind of was just like, you know, just resonating with me. It was kind of just like implanting itself. And, um, and we were, I went, I was going out to, into a, uh, onto a camping trip with my family. I have five kids, by the way. So we have five kids uh, and my, my wife and, and um, we were, we were driving out to the West coast, East coast uh, to Nova Scotia. And we were camping all the way. And um, I, and I write all the time, you know, so I mentioned I have 25 or so books. I don't count, but like, I have a bunch. And so I write, I, all that means is I've been, I write a lot. 
And so going like, we were going to go on this trip for, I think about three, two and a half, two and a half to three weeks. And so I was going to be without my laptop, which is like taking a piece of me away. And, um, and so I was like, well, how, what am I going to do if I have to write? Like I have to, cause I, I, I always write. And so I said, well, I've, I got to bring a notepad. You know, I have, that's all I have. And so cause we, we were camping, my wife likes to camp like rugged. And so we were camping without electricity. And so we were, we were, we were starting our trip and the first night we were in a campsite by this beautiful lake and uh, we were somewhere in Ontario and I started uh, just writing into this notepad and I, I, I was documenting our day there and that what I wrote on that trip actually became on the trap line, uh, which is the picture book. Um, but then it was kind of like this thing where there was more, there was more there and picture books only allow you to write so much. And so I felt like there's way more story. And I just thought that I needed to document everything. I just needed to write, write about our journey. And so I, I just told my, my agent that, and I just said, I want to write a memoir about my dad and I. And so my, my agent approached a bunch of different publishers and Harper Collins, um, you know, he was, he decided that he, they would, they would, they would publish it. And so we, I just dug in and I started to work on the memoir, uh, Blackwater. And, um, and one of the, one of the things that I did initially was, um, I just in, interviewed my dad for that period of time. And, um, and so a lot, everything about my dad and his life and all that stuff in there is directly from my dad. Uh, and then, you know, the kind of the, what was happening with it. And I, I think like the development of the book was interesting because, um, when you write a nonfiction book, um, there are a lot of similar elements to a fiction book. Um, and that's, this is what I found is that there's still there's still a protagonist you know like i'm you know in, when you write a memoir you're the protagonist right so and you still have this kind of hero's journey like in, in a in a fiction novel you still you have this hero's journey and you still have that in nonfiction. and i didn't write i didn't read a lot of memoirs when i was uh starting to think about and research and then write blackwater um what i did do though is i read like a couple of them uh, one of them by my friend wob who wrote uh, The Reason You Walk. And what I didn't take a lot from that to write Blackwater, but what I did take from it was that he, he fashioned it off of like the arc of Star Wars, the Luke Skywalker arc, which is the hero's journey. And I thought, well, yeah, like that makes a lot of sense to me. So, and all this to say, so when, you, when, you, when, I, when I started writing Blackwater, I had to keep in mind the narrative thread that would kind of um, lead me to my goal. Uh, the goal that every hero has at the, at the, in, their, in a story, um, they have like an objective and their objective, uh, objective in my story was the trap line. That was where, that was the journey. And, um, and so when you, when you, when you write a story like that, you still have to stay focused on the, on the narrative, on the thread that you're kind of following to get to where you need to go um, to finish your journey. And as you write that story, there are things along the way that, don't fit into that narrative. They just, so you have to fashion it the same way as a fiction book. So there are things that happen, really happen that you might love to write about. And I did write it, but you have to kind of leave them on the chopping room floor because it just doesn't fit into the story. And so there are so many different elements that I was writing about in, in the first draft of the book or early drafts of the book where eventually they had to be kind of dropped off. And I was thinking like, oh, there's so much being <laughs> dropped off here that I found really interesting. Like, you know, um, and not, this is not like a, you know, this is not like a, uh, a happy moment, but, um, you know, we did discover like, a, a my grandmother had a sister, um, in the course of researching the book and my sister, my, my great aunt, um, she died at residential school. And so we, we and I tried to, I did all this research work in trying to uncover, you know, even her name. Um, and to find out her name and to try and find out how she died, when she died, how old she was, because we didn't know any of that. Um, all we knew is that uh, offhandedly, one time my grandmother mentioned to my mom that she had a sister who died at residential school, and that was it. And so I was able to find out her name, her date of death, um, her age at the time of dying, all of this stuff. And so it was a big, big project to try and find it all out. And but when I was writing Blackwater, not, not a ton of it fit into the, like all this research stuff didn't really fit into the, the book. And there was so much 
stuff that I was doing to find it out. And I thought, you know, this stuff needs a home, you know, and I, and I also felt like, you know, Maggie needs a home, which is my great aunt. Um, you know, she needs a place where the story needs to be told, uh, especially in light of, and you know, what happened last year with all these unmarked graves. My grand, my great aunt is one of the graves that, you know, we, can, we don't know where she's buried. Um, now she's not buried on site uh, on a residential school site, but her her grave is lo lost. And so uh, and I, and I've done a lot of research, searching, trying to find it, haven't been able to find it. But I thought, you know, writing about her is some in some way honoring her and remembering her and making sure that she's not forgotten because um, none of her, none of the family really knew about her. And when they found out about her, when I was doing all this research, it, you could see the kind of like the joy in their faces just finding out that they had this family member and that she is kind of brought back home to them in a way. And it was, so I, so anyway, so all this to say, there's stuff like that, that needed a home. And, and so I had all these recordings of my dad and I used a lot of them, but not, not nearly half of them. And, uh, and I'm a big podcast lover. You know, I, I've, I've listened to a ton of podcasts. I, I love them. Connie Walker is one of my favorite podcasters. If you haven't seen, if you haven't heard like missing and murdered, Connie Walker, um, Finding Chloe, it's like the best podcast series ever made. So if you want to, you know, um, listen to a story that really helps towards reconciliation and is just like breathtaking, uh, is Connie Walker's uh, Missing and Murdered uh, Finding Chloe, or Finding Cleo, sorry. Uh, and so it's, anyway, listen to that. So, uh, but I love podcasts. And so I thought, well, I want to do one because you know, one of the things that I found with, with writing is when you listen to stuff, when you read stuff, when you, you kind of, you kind of feel like you can write in that area. And so like when I write a picture book, I read a lot of picture books and it helps me write picture books. When I started to write graphic novels, um, I, you know, it's because I'd, I'd written a ton of graph, I'd, I'd read a ton of graphic novels. And so I felt like I knew how to write graphic novels. And I still had to teach myself, but I kind of had that experience because I, I read thousands of comics. And so I'd, I'd listened to probably thousands of podcast episodes and I thought, well, I can write a podcast. And so I thought, and that's what, that would be a good home for all this extra stuff. It could be almost like an investigative piece on my own family. And so we, we, uh, I approached CBC and CBC agreed to do this podcast, which became Kiweo. Kiweo is a tree word, which means he goes home. And, um, and so we made it, I worked with this great producer, Julie Dupre. And so at all, at, kind of almost at one time, uh, I started out doing these three projects um, on the trap line, Blackwater and Kiweo. And then as I was working on them, it was great because my dad was working with me. We were recording more stuff together as I asked him more questions. And, um, and then, you know, uh, he, and he, the last thing he ever read of mine was actually on the trap line. He read it probably uh, in early December, 2019. And then everything changed changed when my dad um he died he died uh in late 2019 uh late december right after christmas and so then i had to kind of reevaluate um you know what everything was going to be um because first of all i you know I, I took a step away from it for a couple months when I, but then i needed to go back to it because i felt like i needed him close to me and so i needed to work and so i started and what better thing to work on than his stories um and so so, so we decided that Blackwater wouldn't change very much at all. I just rewrote the epilogue. Um, and then the, um, the podcast, the last episode changed, episode five changed. The other episodes pretty much stayed the same. I just added in episode four that he passed away. Episode five changed and it became like more of an honoring of my father, um, more than an investigative podcast. Uh, and so that was a bit of a change. And then on the trap line was already done. It was in the bag. And so um, you know, we, we, on the trap line came out. The only thing that I would say about on the trap line and the kind of the synergy of working with Julie, who's a very dear friend of mine is that, um, her dad died just before my dad. And so we lost our dads the same month. And so that made on the trap line, a really, really special book to us. And, uh, and, you know, winning the governor generals for it was like, you know, Julie called me and she was like, you know, bawling and I was bawling and it was, you know, we, um, it was like, it was really beautiful and really hard, but, uh, it, I'm really glad that that book, 
um, was made because it was like an it was like a tribute to our dads. Um, so those are all the stories. And um, and I thought what I would do, I don't know if I have so much to say about all of this work. I'm mindful of the time, but um, what I want to do just to maybe end it before we take questions is I thought maybe I'd just read you one more little piece from Blackwater and, um, and, and then I will we'll take some questions for you. And what I think I will do is I'm going to read you just a little piece um, from when my dad, you know, that might be too hard for me. I'm going to read the, um, I'm going to read the epilogue because I think like the epilogue, is um, it's not too hard for me for some reason, but there was a time in uh, like I think 17 years ago or so, 18 maybe 20 years ago, where my dad almost passed away um, from this stomach thing, and um, and I think reading that will be too hard for me, but I think this one is okay. So I'm just going to read the uh, the epilogue for Blackwater, and it's not a spoiler. So I mean, um, but I'm going to read that for you, and then we'll we'll take questions. Oh, quickly though, before I take questions, I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to show you where Blackwater is. I, I forgot I was gonna do that. So um, anyway, here's the epilogue. My dad is in his early eighties and despite my best efforts to will his immortality, he's not getting any younger. He will not be a boy again. He will not be the father I used to know, the father I was unfamiliar with again. Years from now, he will not be this father either. Years from now, he will exist in memories and I will be left to co collide with the open arms of those moments. I remember writing those words no more than a year ago, after dad and I had spent a week together, after we'd engaged in a marathon interview session that was as tiring for him as it was invigorating. On the Monday, he was cautious with his words. He was visibly guarded. By Friday, he couldn't say enough. He'd remember things and offer them up without hesitation, and I accepted these gifts. For the book, sure, but more importantly for myself, my children, his sons, his grandchildren, and generations yet to come. It was an exciting time too, because it felt like the beginning of a new phase in our relationship. We'd been talking for years. Yeah, but not like this. These were the first words in an entirely new conversation, the first steps in a journey that I'd always hoped we'd take. I thought that, that I had more time with dad. I thought that we had years to talk. I thought that we had years to sit together on the couch in his basement and do nothing more than be together in the quiet. I thought that we had years to golf together and that no matter how old he got how or how frail, he'd still beat me. I thought that we had years to watch movies together at Grant Park Theater, talking with each other until the house lights dimmed. I thought that we had years to sit by the fire outside of his cabin at Thunderbird Bungalows in Clear Lake with mom and Cam and all our kids. I thought we had years to meet for lunch at a place where we could both eat because he has no large intestine and I'm vegan. I thought that we had years to meet at education conferences. I thought that we had years to sit together in a study and talk about everything that was going on with my work, with my writing, with my life. I thought that we had years. I thought that we had more time, but we didn't. Dad passed away suddenly but peacefully on December 27th, 2019. His death has brought as many regrets about the times I could have talked to him, could have been with him, as it has regrets about the times we have lost, the times I so desperately wanted to have and thought that we would have. On Boxing Day, I was driving out to Canmore with my family. And while we were still on the road, Jill called mom. Dad answered. Jill asked for mom. Dad called for her from the basement. Then mom was on the phone and dad hung up. That was my last chance to talk to him. No more than a day later, just the blink of an eye in, life, in the span of a lifetime, I was on a plane back to Winnipeg to be with my brothers and mom. Jill and I alternate where we have Christmas dinner. One year we spend it with the Dumonts, one year with the Robertsons. In 2019, it was the Dumonts turn. We stayed at Jill's parents' house until around 9.30 p.m. and then headed home. I knew that I wouldn't see mom and dad for about a week and it was Christmas. So when we pulled into the driveway, I almost told Jill I was going to pop by just to say hi to them, almost. But we had to get up at 3.30 a.m. to start our drive to Canmore, and I didn't want to be up that late. I decided to stay home. I could have had one more hour with Dad. We could have shared some gluten-free snacks. We could have sat together on this couch and watched television. It wouldn't have mattered what show it never did. There are regrets that stretch far beyond the immediate past. 
a few year, few years ago, I promised dad that I'd go see a movie with him. I can't remember mo what movie it was. It doesn't matter. Things came up and I couldn't go to the movie and I forgot to tell dad. The next day, mom told me that he'd waited for me to pick him up. He'd sat on his chair and watched out the window for my car to pull up to the curb, but I never came. It would have been three more hours spent with him that I'll never have. A drive to the movie theater and back. A conversation in two comfortable chairs side by side before the house lights dimmed. Two hours beside him. On January 2nd, 2020, I met mom and Cam at the funeral home. Dad had to be identified before the cremation. I went to support mom and Cam, who were going to view dad's body, and I'd been waffling for days. I wanted to see him. I didn't want to see him. Both Cam and mom thought I shouldn't, but they told me it was my choice. Both Cam and mom told me that he wasn't there anymore. It wasn't really him. He was gone. Two days before Christmas, Jill and I drove over to mom and dad's house in River Heights to give them their presents. Dad was in the basement. I went down to give him his gift, a framed photograph of him, me, Mike, Cam, Elijah, and mom that I took with my cell phone after the Winnipeg Blue Bombers won the Grey Cup on November 24th, 2019. I propped my phone up against the bottom corner of the television, set a 10 second timer and run behind the couch behind dad and the picture somehow turned out perfectly. I told dad to open his present even though it was two days early because I might not see him on Christmas day. He did and then we sat together on the couch on the star blanket he'd been given years earlier. There was a football game on, the Giants versus the Redskins. I told dad how much I hated that, that so many sports teams still had racist names and mascots. He got annoyed at that. Aren't there, any more, aren't there more important things for you to worry about in the world right now, he asked. I backed down. I told him there were. I didn't want him to be annoyed at me. And besides, he was right. There were more important things to worry about. There are. The game went into overtime. I put my head on dad's shoulder. At some point I fell asleep, just for a few minutes. I never fall asleep watching television. I have trouble falling asleep, period. I pray my brain doesn't shut off. That's why I have anxiety. That's why I take medication. But I didn't need it that night, not with dad beside me. Not with his arm pressed up against mine. He was my calm. I'll feel that sort of calm again only when I return to Blackwater because dad will be there with me too. At some point I woke up. Dad turned his head to look at me. After the game ended, Jill called down the stairs that it was time to go. I stood up, leaned over and kissed him on top of his head. That was the last time I saw him. That will always be the last time I saw him. He exists now only in memories and I am left to collide with the open arms of those moments so that was i went longer but um that was the uh the, the epilogue and um before if there's any questions i just thought i'd show you just a, very quickly and show you where dad's trap line is so this is norway house right here and if anybody has never been to norway house before uh, if you have this is norway house here this is rossville this is like the town area of norway house so there's lots of like houses here that it, it's if you drove through it you'd think it would be like a, a little town uh and then over here it's more like what you'd think of a reserve like there's you know there's houses that are further apart from each other and a lot of trees and beautiful stuff around uh and then the, the the community is built on the on the shoreline of a, a a big lake called little play green lake um and then my dad when he went to the trap line uh with in canoes when he was a boat when he was a kid he went there for the first 10 years of his life um, they went up, they followed this waterway here, all these little tributaries. And this is, this is the, the road here. And it goes to this ferry crossing right here, uh, in the, in the winter, it's a winter road. Uh, and then they, they come, they kept going up here with their canoes, uh, a whole like battalion of canoes. They would come up and, uh, and they would meet at this gathering place. This is the, this is called Blackwater. And you can see the water coming in from the Etchmamish river. It's it's uh, looks black, and if you're there in person, it actually looks like a black line across the water, and then it turns from like light blue, lighter blue to black, and then right here is the is the trap line, and it's called Blackwater because of that, and it was a gathering place, so families would kind of gather there and stay there for a little while, 
and they would branch off into their own trap lines. But this is like this is a place of community, of family, uh, and they would they would meet here at the beginning of the trap line season. They, they would come here after the season was over, and they would go back to the community together, all all as one. And they're beautiful. Uh, anyway, so this is this is the place where we spent the day together, and um, I, I, and the beautiful thing is about before I take questions, sorry, is that um, the very next year in 2019, my dad was wasn't feeling well, so he didn't come with us. But um, I took my family out there to the to Blackwater. And so it's like this really cool intergenerational connection. Uh, and that's where healing really happens is like you you have these um, connections that you kind of pass down. So it's like stories are passed down. These experiences are passed down. And uh, I think that one day my, my kids will take their kids out to Blackwater. And that's like, you know, that's like um, how these... Um, these these family experiences these the sense of place this sense of belonging that's how these things really um kind of um they kind of resonate across the years and um i'm really grateful that we were able to you know to make those connections anyway so and blackwater is a part of that connection but anyway that's that's where blackwater is um so that's my presentation i just i just i don't even plan anything um so I see, uh, let's look at questions. I don't, is, is someone going to come in and moderate this? Yeah, I'll, I'll come moderate. Uh, okay. Thanks so much for showing us Blackwater. That was, that was really cool to see on the map and the water actually being black like that. Yeah, it's actually literally, there's a lot of cool like literal names. Like Blackwater is literally because it's Blackwater. Uh, my dad's primary chap line, which is further down, which we've lost. I'm trying to, I'm going to find it one of these days, but it's, it's across a lake called Harry Lake. And it's because there's a bunch of reeds, like stuff sticking up from the water. Um, so if you go, if you look at it from the beginning of the lake, it looks like a whole bunch of hair. And so it's called Harry Lake. So that's, that's why it's called Harry Lake. Wow. Yeah. That's great. Uh, okay, cool. Let's maybe start with this one. Um, so for someone who is indigenous, but doesn't know much about their own culture and family history, how might you suggest approaching how to learn about these things from their own dad, uh, with a family that doesn't talk much about feelings, emotions, or sentimental things. Um, it can be scary and uncomfortable to dive deep into this, uh, into past with families. Yeah. Um, well, my dad was like, like, you know, for me too, my dad wasn't ever too much of a talkative person. Um, it was really over the course of time, um, like easing my way into it. You know, we spent, you know, literally over 30 years um, easing our way into each other, you know, and, um, and so, you know, it was first of all, just like kind of um, just for me, it was developing just like um, kind of friendship with each other uh, and trust. And then uh, over the course of time, you know, just kind of um, digging more and more into that history together. Uh, and the more we did it, the more comfortable we got and the more, the more my dad opened up and uh, and so a lot of the starting point to finding out these kind of family histories to really get a better sense of your identity. Um, like to me, that happens through, um, you know, learning from family. Um, no one is better suited to tell you the history than your own family. Uh, and so, it, but it might take some time to get there. They might not be ready for whatever reason. And so I just think it's a, it's a, it's like almost like incremental, you know, and, um, and you really have to kind of build your way to there and you have to have patience. You know, I think that that's a part of it too. Uh, and then finding out whatever you can just on your own with your own like research, you know, you know, if you have a community that you're from, kind of do some looking into the community, visiting, um, talking to people within the community. I know for me, it was like learning about the residential school there. I was like, you know, I meeting a lot of people in the community. Um, I still, I still go there pretty often to, to do work in the schools and stuff like that. So I think it's also just like implanting yourself in the place where you belong you know I think that that's part of it too um so it's, I think it's a lot of things I don't you know honestly like I don't have a lot of like smart things to say about it I just think that it's that's what it, it that's what it was for me and um if that works for you then you know that's great great um during the presentation you had mentioned that you were you were waiting for your dad to ask you to uh go to the trap line with him and uh, we had a question in the chat and someone's just asking if you could expand on why that was important for you to wait for him to ask. Um, I did, I don't know, really for me, it just felt like, 
I don't know if it would have been, I don't think my dad would have thought it was, but for me, it felt like an imposition in a way. Like I felt like it felt like it needed to be something that my dad was, my dad was ready for so that we were both ready. Um, and so I feel, I felt like we, you know, we had talked about it and, um, I just felt like it was a point in time where my dad was like, you know, asking me, uh, it was not something he would typically do. And so because he did it, it, really, it felt like it, he really had given it a lot of thought and he just felt like it, I was the one he wanted to take me, take up there. Uh, and so, which is, you know, um, was, it was amazing. Uh, and so I, I think that for me, it was just like a, a thing where. I just wanted it to be both of us. And I didn't want to impose that on him to take me. I, I wanted him to just decide that it was time for us to go. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it felt like it meant more that way. Um, and uh, we're lucky, you know, I think that my dad must have felt like he didn't have a lot of time left. And so he just, and that's why I said one last time, I think he knew that he wouldn't have another chance to go up again. And so, you know, we went up. Um, we have a question. Uh, have you been able to share your book with members of your community and youth in Norway House uh, First Nation? Uh, I'd love to hear more about its reception there. I don't know about Blackwater. Um, I, you know, I, I, it's almost like the same kind of thing about imposition. Like, I don't want to um, force anybody to read it or get, you know, I don't want to like ask them to go and read it but in a way. Like, I, um, I want them to, and I think people have read it from the community, um, but I haven't really, it was odd. It's odd because I haven't been up since it came out because of the pandemic. Uh, normally I would be up to Norway house two or three times a year. Um, and I definitely would have, you know, talked to people up there and it would have come up, I'm sure. Um, because, you know, um, they, they know, they know my work a lot up there. Like, you know, the schools have most of my books and the same, things like that. So um, and my family, you know, um, it's hard for them. Uh, I don't think that they've really read the book. You know, there's a, there's a bit of, I think there's a bit of animosity too, like just not to get into family shit, but, oh, sorry, not to get into family yeah. stuff. Like, um, <laughs> like I, I think that it's just, um, there's a, there, I, not a resentment, but I think there's like, um, yeah, there's just a bit of like kind of negative feelings around. I think part, a lot of it has to do with my dad dying um, and, uh, you know, but I think the thing is with me is this is my story. Like my dad said, like, this is my story. It's my, my memoir. It's my perspective on our lives, uh, with my dad. Uh, and it's, you know, so my perspective on our history is going to be different from my brothers, you know, and, and that's just, but I think that's hard. And I understand it's hard for them right now because they lost their dad too. And, you know, they had different relationships with them, but, um, I, I can see why, that book is difficult for them and I totally respect that and if they read it one day then great and if they read it and they think it's shitty then that I, I'm proud of the book so I think that's something that you know we'll, we'll we'll deal with that when it comes to it but um yeah it's a it's kind of like a bit of a weird thing right now and I think a lot of it has to do with the pandemic uh and a lot of it has to do with you know, my dad, my brothers were older when my parents separated. So they also have different feelings about that too. So like, I don't really, really remember. Uh, and so um, that's also, I think plays into it as well. So um, yeah, anyway, I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yeah, totally. Um, you'd mentioned uh, Norway House Cree Nation. They, they have a lot of your uh, books for younger readers. Um, and I was looking into some of the work and you've, you have a lot of like incredible characters in these books. And I guess I'm wondering if you, where you get uh, the inspiration for them. Like, do you write from your own experiences or is it uh, your families or kind of how you come up with them? Yeah, it's like, um, it's, it's all of it really. I mean, it's all of that. Um, you know, I made a very explicit choice when I started to write, to write about indigenous people to address issues that I think would be important for people to learn from. Uh, and, and so a lot of my choices in terms of the stories I write, especially early on in my career, was like deliberate in terms of what needed to be taught in classrooms and how I could contribute to that education. Um, so what, when we were alone, for example, you know, I wrote that book because um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came up with their calls to action they wanted teachers to teach residential school history to kindergartners. 
and I just didn't see like there are any supports for teachers and there, you know, they weren't, we weren't preparing teachers to do it and we weren't giving them the resources to do it. And I thought they need something. And so I sat down to write When We Were Alone and it was a little controversial at the time because there wasn't really a book like it out there in the world. And so, um, you know, even my publisher was kind of hesitant to publish it at first because they just didn't think that it could be done. And my attitude has always been, if you think it can't be done, it's just because we haven't done it yet. So like that, so that's, so that's why when we, when we were alone is out in the world. So I think a lot of it is like looking at gaps that are out there and how I can fill them uh, or, you know, stories that I feel inspired by and I want to tell, or, you know, it's, a, it's just a whole bunch of different things. Like the Bearing Grounds was, you know, it came from learning about traditional Cree constellation stories and then wanting to adapt them into novels. Um, and, you know, I have a, I have a fiction book coming out later this year, an adult fiction book, which was really just a thought that I had of like, I want to take my dad's ashes to this lost trap line. I want to find it. I want to bring him home there. I, my mom would never let me, but like, it was like almost like my dream to kind of like, it's almost like an imagination moment where I'm like, I want to take those. What if I could do that? I thought, well, I can't, but like I could write about it. And so I wrote about this story about this guy whose dad dies and uh, he brings a, his dad's ashes to this lost trap line. And then it became the centerpiece for like father daughter story. But like, that was the, the linchpin of like, that's kind of like the anchor of the story. So that became, so it comes from a lot of different places, but um, you know, I'm always writing. I always have projects, I always have deadlines. And so I'm, you know, I'm not really at a loss for ideas. At least I can't be for the next, I don't know, four or five years. So <laughs> then, I'm, then I'm taking a break, that's it. <laughs> I was gonna say I was looking at the timeline of your your books that have come out and it's it's pretty nuts. You write a lot. <laughs> I don't like to think about it because that's why I say I don't count my books because I just feel like I get I would totally get stressed. I have I already have anxiety, so I think I would just like I don't I just like go I just do. I don't even I don't even look at like what I have next. I just kind of horse blinders and just kind of write. Fair enough. Okay, two two really quick questions. Um, somebody yeah. had said. What are you writing next which you kind of you mentioned is there anything else uh on deck perhaps? well yeah I'll, I'll i'll so i have the adult literary fiction book the the cover and the title are gonna be announced pretty soon it's a big i think they're hope i hope it, i hope people read it because i'm not really known for literary fiction I, I think it's a really good book so i'm really excited for it um and that's coming out with harper collins um i have the, the Missoula saga has become a very big series uh, for me and for Penguin. And so, you know, the Barren Grounds uh, came out two years ago. The Great Bear came out last year. The Stone Child's coming out in August. I'm writing book four right now, which is coming out next year in the summer. Um, I have two picture books coming out next year, which is very nerve wracking for me because it's almost like the standard you set where you want to reach it again. And you know, you're not, you know, it's really rare. So you know, like I've done two picture books. They both won the Governor General's Award, which is like really crazy. And I don't know why, but like, um, then I'm like, well, I have two picture books coming out next year. And if they don't win, the, <laughs> they're not going to win it. So like, if they don't win it, like, does that mean they're failures? <laughs> so it's like this kind of like, yeah. you know, and so, but I have, I'm really proud of them. So they're coming out next year. And um, yeah, I just have, I have a lot of, you know, projects on the go um, that are coming out over the next couple of years. So. Great. And then the other question, um, someone was asking about speaking events where they could maybe hear you speak or what types of audiences you tend to speak to. And uh, there was also a request to come to come to Manitoba, Southern Manitoba to speak, which I think you do quite often. Yeah, I do. A ton. Like I so I usually do about a speaking event a day um, just because I have a day job, too. So I can't do a ton of that. I could probably do a bunch, like more than that. But um, it's a big part of what I do now and not because like for me, it's, it's advocacy. So uh, like, it's become a big part of my work. Uh, you know, I try to, my, my work now has become not just about writing books. It's about, you know, um, doing whatever I can, whatever platform I can to raise issues or to address things I think need to be addressed um, or spoken about or taught. And so I do a lot of uh, classroom visits. I do a lot of, um, you know, I do uh, not as many, but I do stuff like this from time to time. I do, um, you know, a lot of writers festivals um, and things like that, which are always, especially now with virtual, anybody can join from anywhere in the world. So, um, you know, I have, I'm sure I'll do a bunch of writers festivals this year because I have two books coming out in the summer and the fall. Um, and then I, I do guest lecturing and things like that as well at universities. 
So it, about all, kind of all over the place. So sometimes I'll tweet about it. If you want to follow me on Twitter, I'll kind of update what I remember. Um, or if you can always just like email me, if you want to speak, if you want me to speak somewhere, like, you know, at your kid's school or whatever, then you could always just email me through my website. And, um, and there's a form there to email me. I always answer emails. So it's, I'll get back to you. So, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, it was amazing to hear some of your story and I want to thank everyone else for joining us tonight as well. Um, so we will actually be doing a random draw after the webinar ends for someone to receive a copy of the memoir. So uh, yeah, one lucky winner. Um, and they'll receive an email tomorrow about that. Um, Blackwater is featured on the MCIC 2022 book list and we have some other fantastic books we would encourage you to check out as well. Thank you everyone so much for joining us tonight. David, I don't know if you saw the chat, but there's people from all over here, which was great, so. Yeah, I did. Thank you so much, everybody. It was, and thanks to MCIC for asking me again. Um, but thanks, yeah, it was great.